Welcome to the IADI webinar on linking social rights to active citizenship for the most vulnerable, looking at the role and rights of uh, role of rights and accountability in the making and shaping of social protection. And we are joined by Professor Rachel Sabates Wheeler. I'm Rowena, and I'm going to be moderating today's discussion. So this is the 18th webinar in the IADI series. And IADI stands for the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes. IADI's um, webinar series engages with researchers and practitioners from all over the world who bring different ideas to development thinking. So we're really um, excited to be joined by Rachel today. IADI is a Europe-wide network of researchers and students in all fields of development, and it promotes quality in research and education and development studies. And it also promotes the exchange of information amongst its members to strengthen networks and influence development decision makers. And I'm very pleased to be joining IADI uh, today, having been working with researchers in Manchester. I'm actually joining you today from the border of Thailand. So IADI's network and reach is far and wide. Now, before going into the webinar, some technical points. Uh, Rachel's going to present for about 30 minutes, and then we'll We'll then have time for comments and discussion. So to our speaker today, Rachel Sabates Wheeler is a development economist with extensive experience in rural development, institutional analysis and social protection. She has been a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex and a director of the Centre for Social Protection. She has worked with poverty analysis work relating to the PRSPs, so poverty reduction strategy papers, um, working on social protection and migration in more than seven African countries and also on land policy in Eastern Europe and in Central Asia. So now over to you, Rachel. Okay, thanks. I hope, can you hear me, Marina? Great. Okay, thank you so much um, for inviting me to present. I'm just trying to move to the next data um, slide. So I hope you can all see it. So I'm going to talk today, um, in England, by the way, I'm going to talk today um, about some work that I did with colleagues. It's not just my own work. And there's a paper that accompanies this presentation. Um, it came out of work that we did for UNICEF, helping them in Ghana, actually. But it was a bigger piece of work that looked at the issues of rights and accountability in making and shaping social protection. So I've been working in the field of social protection for over 20 years. And for those of you who know about social protection, it's become a massive, massive agenda in the last 10 years in particular. And you can see it very much in the SDGs all over the place. So when I first started working on it, social protection wasn't really, we thought maybe it would just be a passing fad, but it's become very big. And, um, so some of the background to that is, for those of you who are familiar with the social protection debates and the way that it has risen up the development agenda, you'll know that there's been a massive political commitment made for rights-based social protection quite recently, probably in the last five to seven years. So we see it in things like the social protection floor of the ILO, the big frameworks that UNICEF and other UN organizations have put out, and the SDGs. So there's been a real push to make social protection a right. Yet, when we look, and when I look at the, the countries I work in, the majority of social protection provision in lower income aid dependent countries continues to be very much a discretionary handout and conditioned. So it doesn't really often look like a right, particularly when you talk to the beneficiaries, and, and we'll talk about that later because social protection has a right, the rights are not always known or understood and therefore they're not demanded by those who are actually the most in need of social protection. So as social protection grows as an agenda, you know, we need to find out evidence, we need to figure out what it is um, that we need to do to improve the impacts for the most poor and vulnerable because social protection is a policy agenda for dealing with poverty and vulnerability. And, um, if we're going to talk about rights sort of in a sort of rhetorical way, we need to figure out how that actually becomes a reality on the ground. 
So the paper that accompanies this, in it we argue that social protection has the potential to provide a really critical interface between states and citizens, not just to be a handout in a paternalistic way. But of course there's some challenges to that and particularly the challenges providing any kind of public service. Um, when we look at the history of public, so poor public service delivery and accountability. In fact, in the mid 2000s, in the early 2000s, um, we saw a lot of literature coming out of the health and education sectors, which essentially said that public services were failing to meet the needs of the poor and vulnerable. And if you remember, there was a World Development Report in 2000, which was entitled Making Services Work for the Poor. And the problem diagnosis there that was sort of the World Bank um, agenda was essentially saying there was a lack of accountability between citizens and politicians via sort of traditional electoral processes. And these failures led to corruption and um, the misuse of resources. So there was a big emphasis all of a sudden back in the mid 2000s placed on good governance and accountability. Now here's a diagram. If you look on the left hand side, you can look at traditional types of accountability mechanisms, top down ones, the ones we might think of, you know, sort of representative democracy or making sure we have good public bureaucracy, putting in place internal processes so that we have good governance. And if you remember, there was a big push on that. But still, we noticed in, well, in education and health, and now very much so in social protection, that still, even if we just fo focus on the top-down types of accountability, we were finding that still the access and the quality of services was not really being affected for the poorest of the poor. And there was still quite a lot of um, subversion of public resources. So there has been a move probably in the last, you know, 10 years, and there's lots of literature on this that we cite in the paper to think about what does a more direct accountability look like? How do we think about the relationship between citizens and providers? And in this sense, you can think of formal mechanisms, formal mechanisms being things like codes of conduct that you might have in health centers or grievance and complaints procedures, appeals committees, hotlines, um, charters, or you can think of citizen led types of social accountability. So we're going to look at that sort of right hand side of this diagram. Now, in terms of social protection, the most common form of accountability mechanism that is put in place within social protection programs is complaints and grievance procedures. So these might be appeals committees at the local level. They might be set up by the program. So you've got a big cash transfer program. Um, the donor or the government might say, okay, we're going to set up a committee so you can make appeals um, against any grievance or, or raise any problems you have and we'll deal with it. And so to set up these complaints and grievance procedures, I would say they're sort of very, like they're still quite technical fixing, really. It's kind of, if you go back to that first, the kind of around formal mechanisms for direct accountability. And they've got direct benefits because if you set up a complaints procedure when you're providing a service or social protection, then you're going to reduce the risks of fraud and error because there's that accountability. You also have indirect effects from setting up complaints and grievance procedures because you're going to increase the program credibility. So if you're a beneficiary or someone else on the ground, say in a village, poor village, and a cash transfer or a food um, transfer or any kind of social protection program comes your way, if there's a complaints committee, you know that you might be able to go and make a complaint. So the program becomes more credible. And then there's a willingness of communities to actively engage in the program if they know that they're going to have their voices heard. And of course, you also have potential spillover benefits from setting up these procedures, which you could potentially reduce local tension because we know that in some um, programs, social provisioning programs, the elite ten tend to capture some of those benefits. So if you've got a complaints procedure that might actually reduce local tension because um, the poorest of the poor might believe they're more likely to get it. And it should have the ability to empower the most vulnerable group. So that's the theory around complaints and grievance procedures. But what's the evidence? In fact, our paper, we look at the evidence of this and 
there's very little systematic evidence as to whether these kinds of procedures directly influence the quality of service delivery in social protection programs. There's only a few case studies where you actually see this being studied. Um, work I've done on the hunger safety net in Kenya in the early years when they set up the complaints um, committee for that um, program, you know, there was many, many complaints over a two year um, time frame. But when you look at the actual resolution or responses, not even resolution responses to the complaints, only there was only 1,700. So less than half of them were being responded to. Um, I've also worked on the harmonized social cash transfer in Zimbabwe. And even though there was a hotline set up and it was set up um, as a totally independent mechanism, it was, it was run by Deloitte, um, totally outside of the government and donor system, people were unwilling to use that complaints procedure because they worried that they might be found out that it was them who made a complaint, so they didn't actually use it. And when you actually went and spoke to beneficiaries of social protection on the ground and you said, oh, what would happen if you didn't get your um, your cash transfer next month? Would you complain? They'd be like, no, no, no. I'm just happy I got it. I'm just happy that I got anything at all. So they still seem very much as a gift, even though the program document and the program itself started off by saying very much this is a right you, you're able to claim it. So there's not a whole lot of evidence that shows that complaints and grievance procedures um, do a, a great job in, in helping the poorest of the poor claim their rights. Um, and an effective grievance and complaints mechanism is definitely necessary, we definitely need them, but it's not sufficient for a whole system um, that strengthens accountability to beneficiaries in communities. We need to think a bit differently, more differently about that. Um, so what we did is we moved down to that bottom right hand side of that figure I showed you earlier and we thought started saying well you know there's a lot of literature on social accountability and what does that mean within a social protection provision what would social accountability look like so social accountability just by way of helping with definitions describes the efforts of collective actors to demand accountability for the provision of public goods from the state through non-traditional mechanisms. So the core strategy is to make state failures in meeting obligations public, leading to reputational and political costs. So it's about collective actors, civic engagement, the second um, definition and approach towards building accountability that relies on civic engagement, relies on citizens and people um, engaging and, and holding the duty bearers, the government to account. Um, so, you know, just for example, what would that even look like in social protection systems? We might be able to think of things like social audits and they have obviously these sorts of social audits, community-based social audits um, are very much part of um, discussions within the health sector and education, but they also now becoming discussed within social protection sector so that people really understand and understand how to hold um, local officials and the government to account in terms of what their provisions should be. So in terms of the research we did or the questions we asked in the paper, the main question we were asking is how can social protection be designed and implemented in ways that enable vulnerable citizens to claim their social rights and demand accountability? So you, as I said, you can, you can read the paper. I'm gonna go through kind of the main tenets of what we argued and the model we, we kind of use to think about the ways that people can claim their rights. <clears throat> so first of all, we, we made a big case that social protection must be anchored in laws and constitutions and policies as a right. I mean, that goes without saying it needs to be, the fact that it is a right needs to be enshrined in the national policies and legislation and bills. Because if you don't have that legal framework, the programs are going to be vulnerable to political manipulation and you wouldn't be able to guarantee long term state support, particularly when you have a change in um, a government, the electoral cycle, you, you might see the social protection program. We've seen that in many countries. As soon as you change the government, certain social protection or social welfare programs get cut. So it's not as though they were ever particularly a right or a long term um, support 
Um, and furthermore, the, the legislation itself and the constitutional sort of buy into rights plays an integral role in ensuring people can actually demand their entitlements and protect themselves against violation of those rights. So <clears throat> in the paper, we look at three different ways drawing on the history of work of, on citizenship. We look at three different ways that you can think about citizenship. And um, the first way we look at, you can actually think about citizenship as a social right. Um, and social rights as a provision of economic security, health and education. And in this kind of framing, citizens are seen as beneficiaries, as passive consumers of rights. So you might say, I'm going to give you um, the right, or I'm going to give you some education, or I'm going to give you this form of social provision. And the consume, you consume it. So you're essentially sitting there saying, okay, thank you, government, I'll consume that. You don't actually have a say in it necessarily, but it's a provision. Another way of thinking about citizenship is a form of agency, you know, an enabling force encouraging citizens to act and participate in a whole range of fora, political, economic and social decision making as a right. And in this sort of framing, citizens are seen as the users and the choosers of state services. So the states might say, okay, well, we, we welcome you to participate in these political fora or in these economic fora or in a complaints and grievance procedure, or even we might come and visit you and say, well, how would you like to see social protection in your community? How would you like to see it evolve? And we give them a range of op options, you know, and there's some agency there in terms of what they might choose and use in terms of the options on offer from the state or from the donor. And then the third way of thinking about it is to think about citizenship as social responsibility. So the relationship of accountability between the citizen and the state becomes really core in this framing. And so recipients can assert citizenship in an active way. So there's an active form of citizenship um, with rights, but also responsibilities to hold the state accountable. In this way, we can think of citizens actually making and shaping the provision that they need or, or they want. And um, so, what we were trying to do in the paper is to move away, particularly in the social protection um, provision, discourse and design of social protection programs, to seeing the uh, citizen or the participants in a program as mere passive consumers, which often they are in many of the countries I work in, to more active makers and shapers of social protection and how we can do this better. So the conceptual framework that we, we put out there looks like this. If you look at the bottom of the diagram, we've we sort of categorised, obviously this is a continuum, it's not like they sit exclusively in boxes, but in terms of the citizen engagement with the state, you could be a consumer, um, you could just use it and you could choose between the offerings or you can actually try and make and shape what's being offered. And the state um, obviously has a role to play. It, the state and the citizen engagement is interfaced by some social accountability interface. And that could be a closed space. You know, it might just be that the state says, well, we're just going to improve services. We're going to reduce corruption and um, we're going to provide information. And that's our social accountability for you. Um, but they don't actually give citizens or participants beneficiaries any way of discussing that with them. Or the state could say, actually, we're going to invite you to um, talk about um, codes of conduct. We're going to invite you to various fora where we're going to get your input on things. And we're going to ask you, you know, give you some options about what to use. Or you could have at the other end claim spaces where the, the citizens themselves are putting demands on the state, either, like I was saying, through through um, collective action, through citizens' charters, through various types of social audits. Um, and the state obviously has a role to play in this because the state needs to be opened, open to allow citizens to claim it, or the citizens needs to rise up in a very sort of political, potentially confrontational way. But 
if you're going to have a social accountability interface, there needs to be willingness, obviously, from both um, the government or the provider side, as well as those who are benefiting. And so what we were trying to do in the paper is say, let's think about how we can deliver what are now very large, large scale social protection programs throughout the world, how we can think, and if social protection really is a right, because um, that's what a lot of the rhetoric says about it, how are we going to move from these sort of handout type social protection to thinking about citizens and how to help them claim rights. So in the paper, there's three case studies we look at. I'm, I can't talk about them all now because I don't have time. Um, we look at the employment generation scheme in India that's very famous as a social protection provision. We look at Bolsa Familia um, and we look at LEAP, the LEAP program in Ghana. So there's three quite different contexts and we try and draw out different um, ways that citizens and states are engaging um, with social protection but through the lens of social accountability. So in the Indian example, I'm sure lots of you who are listening know about this example very well. But when you look at the history of where Enrega came from, it is the outcome of a remarkable policy process set against, um, set against a history of famine. And if you um, look at sort of what was going on in the country, there was a lot of right to food campaigns, there was a lot of coalitions between activists, a lot of um, political movement and coalitions and claims and discussions going on and sustained civil mobilization and that, that caused a demand for social provision, that caused a demand for social protection and you know, it's obviously a much longer, longer history that I have time to talk about now, but the, there was citizen involvement in drafting the act around um, employment guarantees. And so the social contract between the state and citizens was very much at the heart of the creation and provision of um, the employment generation scheme, guarantee scheme, and it was set constitutionally as a right. And the rights include employment on demand, minimum wages, payment within 15 days, basic worksite facilities, and social audit accountability and grievance mechanisms. So these, you know, it wasn't just like you have a right to X number of days employment, but there was a whole bundle of rights that was negotiated um, between people, citizens, people who were actually interested in having that welfare and providers. So, the Act provides a legal framework for implementa implementation, defining clear citizenship, entitlements, rights and obligations. And there was clear institutional frameworks for how states and local bodies could implement this. So, I mean, I urge you to go, if you're interested in this, go and look in detail at this. Obviously, there have been some criticisms, and there always are, of these big social policy programs, social protection programs. But it, you can see from this example how um, the demand for social protection came from below rather than just a supply of social provisioning from above. And again, there's other examples. There's the Bolsa Familia example, and that was very much a flagship conditional cash transfer program of the Lula government. And the genesis of that program came because there were champions of change at the national level. So it wasn't quite the same as the India example. There were champions of change inside the government, but those, their voices were very influential, but they coincided with the outworking of a decentralization agenda that was initiated in the constitution. And that constitution in 1988 established social assistance as a social right. So there was a lot of build up, there's local pressure and active citizen involvement emerging from the success of this kind of um, decentralization and municipal run poverty pilots. So there was, so when Lula was in power, he actually tried to retract somewhat from providing um, the Bolsa Familia program. But 
um, citizen expectations from this social right in the constitution meant that, that that government was unable to back away from it. So you'll look at that, that's a different um, example where you look at the relationship between the state and an active citizen. And then we also look at the LEAP program in Ghana um, as a very different case. In fact, it was very much a donor funded, donor initiated case, although the government now and has been involved in it for quite some time. Um, but it, it was kind of much more of a top down provision um, and the sort of idea and vision of it came very much out of the last 15 years of thinking about social protection in Africa, large scale sort of programs. Um, but through our work and we had partners, a uh, research partner in Ghana, it wasn't clear that notions of citizenship and rights, they weren't well embedded in the political culture. And there was a very weak decentralized system of governance with very few invited spaces. So what we saw, particularly when we were talking to beneficiaries, is that even though the donors had and the government had tried to put in place some kind of technical fixes for social accountability, um, a lot of the beneficiaries still saw um, the LEAP program as discretionary payout, a gift that might end at any point. Um, furthermore, when you look at the complaints and grievance procedures and any of the systems that were put in place, like the hotlines, there was very limited uptake of these procedures, mainly due to low literacy. People wouldn't, didn't know how to actually um, make appeals or make claims. There was excessive delay in case management of any kind of grievance or appeals. And um, beneficiaries also were very worried about complaining because um, the payment they were receiving was so important to them, they were worried about being moved off the program. So it's just in a different phase. Um, but, you know, what we're here to do is talk about how to design going forward better social accountability mechanisms for social protection provision. So here's just some reflections. This is the last slide um, and we can have a discussion. You know, despite the massive growth in social protection that we've seen in the last um, 10 to 15 years, there, has, there still remains limited attention to building strong accountability and rights. Perhaps there's even a prior question around whether um, the providers of social protection even see it as a right or not, whether we see it as a right or not. So assuming it is one, then there is limited um, discussion around this. And what can, what can we do about it? What can be done? I mean, as I've been discussing, there's different catalysts for building active citizenship. I mean, we can work with civil society, different um, governments and donors can support civil society, strengthen the social contract that way, identify champions for change that will take certain um, initiatives forward. Um, of course, we need to have in place all forms of social um, accountability systems, whether they're more sort of instrumental type ones, such as just provision of information or codes of conduct, to more um, you know, social audits that communities are empowered to actually undertake. There's an external factor that I haven't talked much about here that comes up in our paper that what is the influence of donors um, in regard to this? What is their, what is their role to play? Should they even have a role? How, how do they influence how social protection is um, rolling out in some countries? And then lastly, building state capacity to enable citizen voice and respond is as important as facilitating citizen voice itself. So it's not just about working sort of with people on the ground, poorer people, vulnerable people to claim the rights. It's about saying, well, how does the state respond to this? What kind of capacities we build within the state to actually enable or, and take on board um, citizens and what they have to say. And that requires obviously goodwill um, and, and a lot of issues that need to be dealt with in the political sphere. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned here that we could talk about is, you know, I've talked, I've, I've framed this very much in terms of citizens. Um, other work that I do in other areas is around 
migrants and displacement and oftentimes people are sitting in countries they know, don't have a claim on the state at all because they're not citizens so there's another um, area there that needs to be looked at in terms of social accountability for non-citizens and non you know people who are not linked into the state how do we ensure social accountability for those groups of people um, as well so i will leave it at that um and i'm happy to take questions thank you thank you very much rachel and i'm sure everyone will agree that that was fascinating. I'm trying to work out how to uh, put my video back on. But in the meantime, if everyone wants to think about um, any questions and just flag in the chat that you would like to ask one. Um, while you're having a th um, thinking, I will um, I just like to, to touch on what you, you said there. And when you were talking about Ghana, Rachel, you, you, you mentioned that the program was led by, um, was catalyzed by donors and external agencies. And then in your reflection said, OK, there's, we should look at uh, the, the influence there in, in designing social protection programs. And I just wondered what sort of influence that has when an external agency is, is leading a program. What does that have any influence on people, people's notions of citizenship? Yeah. Um, OK, so I'll respond, but there might be others who could respond better than me, but um, I'll give it a go. So. Uh, I've worked on a little bit on the LEAP program in Ghana. I've worked on program, the Productive Safety Net program in Ethiopia and the Hunger Safety Net in Kenya and the, in the big one in Rwanda. They're all very similar in a way. And all of them, I mean, while the Productive Safety in, in Ethiopia is very much government led and run now, it was initiated by donors, push, push, pushing. And then the same in Kenya, very much initiated by donors. The Zimbabwe one initiated and even mainly funded by donors. And I think, you know, the DFIDs, the World Bank, whatever of this world, they, there's a knowledge that they have to set up certain types of social accountability mechanisms within these programs. And that's why typically there's quite a technical fix. It's like, okay, here's, we're either gonna set up a hotline or we're gonna have appeals and complaints. And I guess one of the problems is with that, first of all, is, I mean, the programs itself, where, where did the motivation come from? Unless the government really wanted it in the first place or the citizens were demanding it in the first place, how could we possibly expect a social contract just to emerge? It wouldn't, it couldn't. Um, particularly say if some country like Zimbabwe, the government wasn't willing to put money behind it and they haven't, and it's, and it's pretty much closed I don't know if it's closed down, maybe someone would know, but the government never put resources behind it. So the government was happy for someone else to give its poor people money um, or cash or food. But if the, the gov say the donor had said, actually, we're not funding it anymore. I don't know whether what kind of social contract the government never said, well, we're going to fund it forever. And that's probably why the citizens were like, well, we're just happy with what we can get. So it's it, that donor influence is really tricky when you think about social accountability mechanisms and how does the donor, you know, as long as the government is slowly stepping up and funding these large scale programs and taking ownership of them, I think there's a role to play for not just the donors, but in international NGOs, NGOs to try and say, you know, this is how you set up um, procedures and spaces where you can actually um, hear from your citizens, hear from your beneficiaries and try and create something that's beneficial for them because otherwise there's just limited motivation for it. So it depends on the country, depends on how the program evolves, I would say. But when I took, pointed out the India example and the Bolsa Familia example, it's clear that they were nationally homegrown products um, where there was a lot of citizen engagement. So that's probably why they look much more like you would think of as social rights as opposed to social gifts. <laughs> but uh, maybe someone else has something else to say about that. We actually have a question from uh, Claudia Rodriguez. Claudia? Um, hi, everybody. Um, do you hear me OK? Perfectly, Claudia. OK. Um, yes. Well, thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you, Ruina, for um, inviting us to the 
uh, webinar and Rachel for your presentation. It made me uh, think about um, many things because I'm also, um, I'm a PhD student at the International Institute of Social Studies here uh, in the Netherlands. And I am also studying the intersection between uh, social policy more generally and uh, rights. And I have maybe two comments to discuss. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is about um, your categorization on what is citizenship. Um, maybe if you can go back to the slide where you categorize citizenship as a social right. Thank you. Uh, that would be great. Because um, from my professional experience and my research, I find that um, when you think about citizenship, and social right as a human right. Um, it, I mean, these three categorizations come, come kind of blend together, right? They, uh, they give um, uh, the citizen uh, a form of agency. It also gives them an entitlement but it also gives them a mechanism uh, to ask the government to comply with an obligation. Um, and this is um, pretty much what is happening in Latin America. Um, Latin America has very strong human rights movements that range from um, you know, the right to food, the right to land, and is moving um, increasingly to social protection and to other social policy fields like um, education and health. Um, so I, I was just wondering if um, uh, you could also see the citizenship as a blend of all these three. Um, mm -hmm. That would be my, my first point. And mm -hmm. the second one is um, about how to design uh, more accountable or mechanisms that make uh, social protection uh, more accountable. You mentioned that uh, an important step was the incorporation of these rights in law. And I also want to go back to the experience of Latin American countries because since the 1990s, um, they have incorporated social protection, social security, health, education, and other rights in their constitutions, right? And it has uh, been uh, seen as not enough, right? Um, and the problems that these countries are facing now is that even though they have these institutions they have these rights institutionalized. The power relations behind uh, the design and the operation of uh, social protection and other social policies become, um, you know, this obstacle for actually claiming these rights. So mm -hmm. one of the things that is happening there is that um, there is a very technical language that uh, is difficult to comprehend and is mm -hmm. a tool that governments and policymakers are using to uh, make the discussion difficult. The other thing that is happening there is that um, there are interest groups that want to keep the status quo and uh, they negotiate behind, you know, the counter with the government and even with uh, civil uh, society organizations to keep mm -hmm. things as they are, you know. Um, so I, I just wanted to, uh, because I, I, I hear that your experience is more, uh, the, the cases that you're studying come from um, Africa and, and Asia, um, I think it's worthwhile to look at the Latin American context because the institutions there are a little bit more developed um, uh, social protection has had a long tradition there, so you see other type of, of phenomena there. Mm -hmm. And the, maybe the last thing is because of these your more institutionalized ways of understanding uh, social protection as a right and also um, having in place uh, accountability mechanisms, there is an additional phenomenon that we are seeing because these two are not enough. So what is happening there is that people are going to the courts to ask for their rights. And in that way, 
trying to uh, balance the power relations between the citizens and uh, the policymakers and the government or these interest groups. And this is, this is kind of interesting because you're now uh, getting um, uh, a new actor uh, in this um, in this scenario, which we do not understand very well how it's influencing this process and this accountability process, and it's also interesting because their standing point is the protection of these rights and and uh, giving voice to the most vul vulnerable and the poor. So I just wanted to leave those comments uh, there and maybe open the debate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudia. That's really helpful. There's a lot there. Um, really, really, really helpful. Um, I, that's, I guess, I mean, you are absolutely right. The Latin American example is quite different. Um, we did include the, the study of Bolsa Familia in Brazil, and it was quite different. And, I, and you are definitely right that there's a lot more in Latin America, it's been a lot more human rights movements, much more civic awareness around human rights. Um, and I think, so this slide you asked me to go to, I, I think you're right. There's definitely, you can see citizenship as a blend of the three. And I think in the um, framework that I presented, it's certainly not like necessarily distinctive consumers, users, makers and shapers, citizens acting in those ways. There's kind of a continuum, it, um, but it was, and it's kind of more of a simplistic device, heuristic device to try and understand um, the way that citizens or beneficiaries participate or are able to access rights around social protection. And, and so I've seen them in different places I've worked in, but I think that um, your work um, in Latin America, potentially, I don't know if you put out a specific publication on it yet, would be really useful, um, particularly for people like myself who work mainly in the African continent, where social protection has a very specific flavor to it, because it's usually around aid dependent countries who are very much relying on a sort of an external perspective or donor perspective. Um, an ILO pushed perspective on what human rights and social protection flaws are. So um, I, I just, I think all your comments are very worthwhile. I'm trying to, I don't think I can answer them in any quick way. Um, I'd be interested to see some of your work and maybe talk about it as well. That'd be great. Thank you. Maybe others have comments for Claudia or me. <laughs> We, uh, we have some uh, commentary that's just been typed up. Um, so I think this is a question from Kate Proust, who's a research associate with the Effective States um, and Inclusive Development Research Centre at the University of Manchester. Um, and she says, um, her microphone's broken, by the way. Thank you for setting out this framework, which gives interesting insights into types of interfaces between states and citizens. I was wondering if you could say a bit more about how these interfaces might be influenced by broader state society relations. For example, some contexts are more politically constrained than others. And also relations between national and local government, especially in decentralized settings. Is there a way to capture these differences in the framework? Right. You want okay. some thinking time for that or are you? Yeah. I don't, yeah, I think, you know, or maybe you'd have to read that because it's quite complex. You'd have to read that sure. to me again. Okay, so it was... Or maybe even, oh, Kate's... Um, she's typed it out if you want to have a look at it. Yeah, I was just saying she might actually have more, she might have a lot to provide on this, that's why, because she's asking the questions, so I was just, but if she can't, if her mic's not working, it's not working. Yeah, she can't. So she's looking at, um, so when there are constraints in, um, political constraints, for example, um, relations between national and local government, so especially in decentralized settings. So is there a way to capture that in your framework? I'm hoping my summary did justice there, Kate. And we do have another question. So if you want to have another question and then think about the answers at the same time, I'm... Okay. We could do that. Um... Um, I'm trying to think about this um, political constraints, decentralized settings. 
So we will give you some thinking time and I've lost the name of the, the I'm still bearing with the uh, technology here, but the next person who is in the queue, if you want to unmute yourself and, and ask a question to Rachel and she'll scribble it down and, and get thinking as best she can, as quick as she can. Hello, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Maria, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this talk. It was very, very helpful. I was just wondering if you could talk about a little bit more um, about this external factor in, in countries where there is a lot of corruption and they are involved in a much more a kind of political will context uh, where social protection has been affected because of this corrupt system and the political will if the external factor could kind of uh, balance the weight and just measure how social protection is um, provided to citizens. So that would be it. Okay. Thank you very much. And if you want to think about that um, in the meantime, Rachel, we do have um, Biznia Majid who would actually like to respond to Kate's question. So that gives you some thinking time. Biznia? Sorry, can you hear me? We can hear you now, great. Hi, it's Basina. Um, thank you so much, Rachel and Kate, for your question. Um, I think it really got me thinking in terms of even if we design our programming to take, in, take into account the frameworks that you've outlined, there's kind of two sides to the coin, particularly I'm talking on behalf of the Middle East. Um, how do we support governments to be able to not even process, understand, a kind of the learnings that we have from these mechanisms, but how do we just get them to acknowledge certain basic citizen needs? And I think that's where Kate, maybe you were getting it in terms of the relationship in terms of political economy and how does that, what does that mean for this new development of a relationship between citizen and state, particularly somewhere like the Middle East? So just kind of wanted to throw that into the bag for everyone to think about. Yeah. Great, thank you. Really, very difficult questions, obviously. Anyone who works sorry. In, anyone who works in political science arena, which you probably do, and I'm sure Kate does, and I don't, I realize how difficult it is. And I, I know Sam Hickey's work and how complex um this is. I guess the only experience I've personally had around the decentralization, social protection, accountability is in um the hunger safety net um program where um, in northern districts of regions of Kenya where different districts were given sort of pretty much responsibility, were given their budgets, responsibility to design their own forms of social protection, whether they were like um, very localized cash transfer programs. And um, it's highly complicated because the, you know, when, when you think about the decentralized program that, look, that could look quite different to something that sort of the federal level wants or wants to roll out and the lack of transparency around where the budget's going and, and what it looks like you know it's it's horribly complicated so you know while this paper might lay out okay this is all very interesting rhetorically and good to think about and we can see examples where citizens have had an impact such as in the Latin American cases. Um, when you think about, yeah, when you think about how the actual programs, I'm thinking social protection rather than health and education, how they actually get designed and where they get designed and at what levels, it, it just gets, it gets minefield. So I don't, obviously I'm not answering that question. Um, I don't have enough evidence on it to answer that question, but it, it is very complicated. Um, Maria was talking about the external factor and in countries particularly when there's very high levels of corruption or lack of trans um, transparency, could the external factor balance this in how social protection is provided to citizens? Um, I, I mean, I guess it could. You People might have more experience in these kinds of contexts. I mean, in Zimbabwe, for example, when I was working there on this harmonized social cash transfer, because <clears throat> UNICEF and DFID were not um, comfortable at that point with 
putting their money through the government um, systems for social protection. And because at that point, the government had not committed to putting more budget or any budget into the, to the system, then the whole social accountability mechanism for that social protection provision sat totally independently outside the government, outside even of um, the program. And we interviewed the, the people, Deloitte it was, you know, it was a big, huge consultancy firm. It was a very expensive social accountability mechanism. Um, but, and they were extremely good at taking for grievances, appeals, representing beneficiary interests to the government. But the government, unless it had the will, and it often didn't, to actually deal with those complaints, it couldn't move because unless you set up a system, a social protection system, like a lot of some NGOs do, international NGOs, it's totally separate, um, parallel, even to a government system, you can't really manage um, your accountability mechanisms. So I have seen some NGOs, smaller NGOs, like Concern Worldwide, set up um, social protection graduation programs in, say, Burundi, um, where you know, social accountability is not between the state and the city, it's between the provider, which is the concern worldwide, and the, the beneficiary, and there it works very well. But as soon as you try and scale it up to the government, um, the whole thing changes again. So anyway, they're just some experiences I've had, but maybe other people have had more pertinent ones they could share. Is there anybody who's listening in that would like to, to contribute? Um, Nikhil, I think uh, you would like to talk about decentralization, so please speak. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Rachel. Um, hey, Nikhil. Nikhil's an author of this paper. Yeah, so it you... came in a little late, but um, I, yeah, I, I wrote a bit of the, the, the India case study, and so I was listening in to the the really interesting discussion around Latin America and how that potentially uh you, you take learnings from India and Latin America and bring it to a place like parts of Africa where Rachel has worked, where essentially the dialogue between citizens and states is not strong. And then I think it then becomes interesting. Kate's question becomes interesting about decentralization because um, we talked about in the paper how unlike, say, health or education, social protection is more technocratic, right? You get from the central level to um, the local level in, in one swoop, and there aren't, say, interfaces to the same extent, um, like in health, where a citizen can engage with a health facility or an education where, you know, you have a parent-teacher association. So then how do you build those interfaces and essentially use those interfaces to build political capabilities for citizens? And that's the question we try and think about uh, or start thinking about. Um, and I think decentralization then becomes a key part of that. For example, in social protection, um, Rachel, you talked about, you know, what do grievance mechanisms look like? Well, they're technical fixes. I think it's true. They're, they're not actually uh, actively building citizenship, like for an in India where Narega citizens have to demand their right to work. You know, the whole conceptualization of that is different than uh, here's a suggestion box and here's how you complain if you're not getting something. Uh, I just came back from Zambia where um, they've started to think about empowering community structures through, I think they're called CWACs, Community Welfare Assistance Officers, to essentially monitor whether social protection is, is getting to beneficiaries or citizens, but also secondly, to start um, like essentially bringing messages to people that this is a right. And um, I think that's been really interesting and almost a side discussion in Zambia as you start instituting uh, rights-based approaches. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna stop here because I've been talking too long. But it's, it was more of an <laughs> more of an addition, and but like good to see this this paper getting some uh, visibility. Mm, thanks, Nikhil. And thank you for joining us, Nikhil. It was a, a great contribution, and I know that Kate has said that she would like to follow up with Rachel when she's got a working microphone, and possibly also Nikhil as well, because I know she's also been looking at uh, social protection in Zambia. So we have a, a few minutes left. Is there anyone else who would like to put in a comment, share their experience or research or a, a question? Or indeed, Rachel, is there anything that you haven't been able to talk about that you would like to use these last five minutes to uh, to share? <laughs> 
I really enjoyed doing this paper um, with my co-authors um, because it's, it took me a little bit out of my comfort zone in terms, and Nikhil will know this as well as in terms of the political economy side of it. Um, but it's so important because all the social protection programs I work on, and as I said, you know, 15 years ago, people would never have thought social protection would have come such a huge, it's almost like a new development paradigm. Um, and it's just so critical that it, just in terms of the longevity of providing people's welfare, you know, if that's going to happen in a lot of countries I work in or any country, there needs to be some kind of notion. What is the right and how do people act? How are they actually empowered to claim it? And if it, if, if it's withdrawn, if this, whatever provision you have, whatever is withdrawn, what's going to be the response? Ask, you know, are the beneficiaries, are the claimants actually going to be able to rise up and get that right or, or not? And there's a whole bunch of other questions that are super interesting. For example, if you look in South Africa, there's been some literature quite a long time ago coming out of South Africa around, you know, after the end of apartheid, you saw a massive explosion in a lot of welfare payments and welfare provisioning. But at the same time, maybe that's just seen as a way of placating poor people to keep them marginally happy so they don't actually get angry with the system and challenge what you know the powers that be and say actually we want proper um provision rather than just sort of basic drip feeding so you know it's a really really interesting discussion um and it will definitely evolve there's lots of work going on on social accountability in other sectors that lends itself very well to social protection so while I might not continue to work on it, I would encourage others to work on it. It's, it's a really important area. Thank you very much, Rachel. Well, we will close the webinar here. I'd like to thank everybody very much for their time, for their discussion and their great and very challenging questions. To thank Rachel very much um, for the time that you've given us and the preparation. And I know Iadi has been very keen to talk to you for some months. So thank you very much for, for giving us uh, this time. To let everybody know that if you couldn't uh, join all of this or if you've had friends who couldn't join and colleagues, it will be on the EADI website later so you can share it. And Rachel's paper has been made um, open access. It's available on the uh, IDS website. Um, there's a link to it there. It's also in uh, one of the reminders from myself and, and EADI. So do, if you haven't had a chance to read it, uh, do go and read it. And thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.